Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second edition of the Tourism Data Leadership Conference. My name is Fiona Lowe and I'll be your MC for today. Today's conference brings together thought leaders, data experts and tourism associations to share insights and discuss the use of data to drive business outcomes. It is very lovely to see more than 250 of you gathered online this afternoon. So just a couple of administrative details before we start. The program will last for about two hours. There will be a short Q&A segment after every presentation, so you can send in your questions using the Q&A function, and we will do our best to address as many as we can. And I'm taking a look at the chat box right now. It's um, going on, everybody's saying hello to one another. So please make use of the chat box to say hi. And uh, if you have any questions, you have to go over to the Q&A function, okay? Now this session is recorded and the link to review the recording will be shared with you after the event. And at the same time, we will be sharing the presentation slides and materials with you. So do remember to complete the post-event survey before you leave the webinar. Your active participation will be greatly appreciated. So without much further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Wang Ming Fai, Chief Technology Officer from Singapore Tourism Board to deliver his welcome address. Ming Fai, please. A very warm welcome, friends and colleagues from the tourism and data sectors to the second edition of the Tourism Data Leadership Conference. I'm Ming Fai, Chief Technology Officer of Singapore Tourism Board. Last year, I shared STB's three-step framework, learn, test, build, to help tourism businesses accelerate their transformation. The focus then was largely building enterprise digital capabilities and empowering staff with data. Many of you have embarked on your data journey and some of you have done it through STB initiatives such as the Data Analytics Shift Program, or DASH in short, and it has received many positive feedback. We are grateful that three of our partners, SETS, Park Hotel Group, and Give Me, for being here with us today to share the successes and learning takeaways from their data transformation journey. In today's environment, data has become a key resource for businesses. While each of us collects some data about our visitors, we, none of us really have a comprehensive view of the end-to-end -end journey of visitors. Unless we come together to collaborate and unleash the power of collective data for actionable insights to attract more visitors, provide better experiences, and market relevant products and experiences to them. We need to have insights about the journeys of our visitors into Singapore, ideally from the time they arrive at Changi Airport to the time they depart. For example, when and where are they spending their time in Singapore? And given the impact of COVID, how have their behaviours changed? What are their new priorities? How can we get better at anticipating their needs? I know it's easier said than done, but we need to start dreaming and trial new ideas. Through the pre-event poll, more than 68% of you indicated that you're willing to collaborate and share data with other tourism partners. And that's very encouraging. At the same time, I also understand that there are concerns when it comes to data sharing. For example, will, will I lose my competitive advantage? Will I violate PDPA? These are valid concerns, but there are solutions to them. We need to come together, start talking, trial solutions, learn together, and I believe we will reap the benefits of collective data. And it is really very much towards this problem that we want to focus our conference today. The theme for this year's conference is forging a collaborative tourism industry through tourism insights. Through the presentations and panel discussions today, I hope all of us can learn more about the benefits of data collaborations and get some great ideas of how you might be able to start. Furthermore, STB has created platforms such as the Singapore Tourism Analytics Network, STAN, and the Tourism Information and Services Hub, TIH, for, to facilitate data sharing and information sharing. 
For example, Data Marketplace is a new feature on STAN that facilitates safe data sharing between industry members. And there are already more than 50 data sets available for your consumptions. In addition, you will not be alone in this journey. STB is putting together a data community where you and I and our colleagues and partners can come together and be plugged in to learn from best practices, initiate problem statement discussions, find suitable collaborators to start a project and learn from one another. It is a community that you can reach out to when you want to bounce off an idea. And through this community, my team and I also hope to hear from you how STB can continue to support your industry and companies. To this note, I'm pleased to announce the official launch of T-Cube Connect, a tourism data community facilitated by STB. To join T-Cube Connect to participate in talks, networking events, and data workshops, please scan the QR code on your screen. Uh, alternatively, you can also click on the hyperlink in the Zoom chat. Finally, I would like to thank our presenters for embracing the spirit of open sharing of knowledge and experience and for taking the time to be in person at the recording studio today. To our audience, do participate actively by sharing your views and questions. I hope you will have many useful takeaways from this conference and be more inspired to start your data collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ming Fai. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to know your thoughts about data sharing. So let's do a quick poll. So right now, you will see a question popping up on your screen. And you can take this time to select the most appropriate option for you. So this is our first poll in relation to data sharing. Here is your options. I don't see any business value in doing so. I am cautious as I'm concerned about possible PDPA GDPR infringement. I'm concerned about sharing information with my competitors. I'm willing but need professional assistance and advice to manage PDPA regulations, or it is okay as long as identifiable information and personal details are not shared. So I'm seeing your answers coming in very, very quickly. Um, oh, it's a very close tie. Some of you say that you're willing, but you need professional assistance and advice. It's also okay to do it. And let's end the poll and take a look at what's the final result, shall we? So 30, oh, it's a very close tie. 30% of you said that you are willing and 31% of you said that it is okay as long as identifiable information and personal details are shared correctly. All right, so thank you so much for participating in the first poll. You can expect more polls like that coming your way. And we also like to invite everybody to share via the chat function as well. So kind of next, I would like to invite our keynote speaker, Mr. Marcus Bartley-Johns, Asia Regional Director, Government Affairs and Public Policy from Microsoft to deliver his speech on data collaboration for impact. Let us explore how we can collaborate together, unleash the power of collective data for actionable insights. I'll be having a short chat with Marcus after his presentation, so if you have any questions for him, please send it in via the Q&A function during his presentation. Handing the time over to you, Marcus. Thanks very much and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to congratulate the Singapore Tourism Board and all of you for participating in this discussion on such an important topic. And thank you for the invitation to be a keynote speaker. I think this topic of data sharing is such a crucial one that's shaping the future of this industry and all industries. Data sharing and collaboration is something that we at Microsoft hold close to our hearts as well. We believe that technology alone cannot draw insights to drive real business outcomes. Sharing and making real sense of data is what multiplies impact. So I'd like to start by asking a fundamental question. Why so much talk and discussion about data collaboration? What is the business value? Traditionally, we've seen businesses collecting their data independently of one another. Those who have the means to collect, store, and mine large quantities of data will inevitably have an edge over those who do not have access or resources to do so. However, the modern world has seen an explosion of tech-driven innovation, and businesses are innovating faster and better than before with exponential growth in data collection. 
just to put things into perspective, the world is generating more data in one day than all data that was generated until the year 2000. And with more than half the world's people, along with our active use of mobile devices, Asian businesses and consumers are generating more data than anywhere else in the world. The Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, or the OECD, has estimated that data access and sharing could generate benefits worth between 1% and 2.5% of GDP in the case of private sector data. So there is a clear link between data sharing and economic benefits that organisations can tap on for growth. By collaborating and sharing data, we can unlock new business opportunities, stimulate innovation and competition as businesses compete to develop new products, services and experiences that cater to consumer preferences. For tourism businesses, such data collaboration efforts can mean mountains of insight on consumer needs and potential opportunities to consolidate data to more effectively serve your customers. Coupled with the power of the cloud and the rise of AI, data presents incredible opportunities for business growth and solutions across the region. What's amazing about data sharing initiatives is that for them to work efficiently, they need to transcend individual organisations. When competitors can come together to share data, this is when we're able to see the real business value and impact. And to illustrate, I wanted to share with you two stories of how organisations have applied data sharing to their business models and the outcomes that they have achieved. The first I'd like to share is through the work that we do with the Royal Bank of Canada, RBC for short. This is the largest bank in Canada and it serves 17 million clients operating across 36 different markets. RBC wanted to deliver exceptional digital experiences to their clients, but also satisfying growing expectations for personalised services. So what they did is piloted a privacy-preserving, multi-party data-sharing platform built on Microsoft Azure Confidential Computing, known as the Virtual Clean Room. The Virtual Clean Room brings together data from RBC, which has deep data, on where clients shop, and retail businesses, which have deep data on customer purchases. To ensure this platform generates and shares insights without providing access to any individual or groups of customer data sets, neither participating retailers nor IBC can see each other's data, despite insights produced on both the vertical and horizontal levels. Doing so has allowed RBC to gain a comprehensive understanding of client behaviors that then allows them to provide more personalised services while still maintaining confidentiality and privacy. And in turn, small businesses benefit as their customers receive special offers and product discounts that are more relevant to them based on richer insights generated by RBC and their retail business partners. For a second example, turning a little closer to home, I wanted to share about the AI Open Data Consortium in Japan, which Microsoft is a part of. Established in 2019, this group is looking at practical ways to help AI practitioners share data more easily. They're working on contract templates and smart contracts, for example, uh, across organizational boundaries to bring together practical ways of sharing data for AI development purposes. By building a platform and a community to distribute data efficiently, this is helping accelerate the research and utilization of AI in Japan. Solutions such as these have shown that creative approaches can be taken to ensure privacy and security while still facilitating the sharing of data efficiently and effectively. Now, I'm sure the question on all your minds, and we heard that already through the poll earlier, is how can your organization implement data sharing initiatives in a trusted and safe manner? We recognize there are definitely challenges that businesses face when implementing data sharing initiatives. And there are a number of reasons for this, including a concern about commercial sensitivities being uh, infringed, privacy or cybersecurity. Addressing these concerns and implementing practical approaches to address them is important for creating the trust required for data sharing initiatives. I'm going to start by talking about commercial sensitivities, but before that, I did want to pause and just put this all into context and begin by talking about the spectrum of open data, which has been a helpful tool for us at Microsoft in thinking about what data can be shared. We might often think that the most sensitive data we hold is the one we should share, 
But by taking this step back and thinking there's different types of data within an organization, it can help us start with practical ways of coming together with other organizations and sharing data. So beginning with this context is important. To tackle the three challenges that I mentioned, first, I'd like to talk about addressing commercial sensitivities. Of course, as business owners and operators, you might be concerned that sharing data means making it available to competitors. But there are practical measures that can be taken to ensure that only aggregated pooled data would be available for analysis, for example. There are also legal controls that can be put in place, for example, agreeing to MOUs with the other parties that can restrict the type of data shared. So these kinds of practical ways we're seeing more and more use of to overcoming some of the commercial sensitivities involved. One important tool that we've seen and we have contributed to as Microsoft is the use of standard data agreements. Often what we see is the same issues come up time and time again in data collaborations. So by using standard data agreements, we can accelerate the process of negotiation and cooperation among stakeholders. The second key challenge that we hear time and time again, and it was interesting to hear it highlighted in the poll before, is how privacy can be protected while sharing data. Again, there are a number of practical methods that we're seeing more and more use of to address this challenge. There are technological means. We're seeing data collaborations use uh, differential privacy, for example, to aggregate insights from data sets without learning about specific individuals. So there's more and more practical techniques uh, being involved. And organizations can also implement sandbox mechanisms so that access to the raw data is restricted and only data that has been anonymized and adequately hashed can be shared. Regulatory concerns are a key one that we hear time and time again. And this is especially true given the fast pace of regulatory change across Asia. What's been really positive to see is privacy regulators in particular sending a positive message about encouraging data sharing and collaboration. For example, in Singapore, the Personal Data Protection Commission has published templates for data use agreements for seeking the consent of data subjects and for the appropriate disposal of data. And that's helping simplify the data sharing process for organizations while also strengthening privacy practices. And I think importantly, it gives reassurance from the privacy regulator that they support data collaboration initiatives. The third challenge, the final one that I wanted to touch on, relates to cybersecurity. This is obviously top of mind for organizations all over the region. And we hear consistently a concern that greater data sharing and collaboration could create new cybersecurity risks. We need to acknowledge these concerns, but we also need to understand there are practical solutions to address them. In fact, we've seen that data sharing can even strengthen cybersecurity by widening the data set available to analyze and highlight threats and thwart cyber attacks. And there are sound security practices available now, like the use of access and authentication procedures to ensure that only appropriate people have access to personal information. Security by design approaches can help mitigate security risks when developing new data collaborations. And another important way of ensuring security is built in from the start is by migrating to the cloud. Cloud infrastructure is built from the ground up with modern security and privacy in mind, and security considerations are included as part of the development process. These practical steps can help bolster an organization's security posture and allow businesses and individuals to share data efficiently and with peace of mind. Ultimately, trust plays an essential role in data access, sharing, and reuse. As we encourage and facilitate more data collaboration in the region and locally, we must recognize there's no one-size-fits-all approach. The key to implementing a successful data sharing initiative lies in charting a principled course, remaining flexible, and being open to testing innovative models and solutions. And it's vital that organizations seek and deepen opportunities to collaborate both within the private sector and with the public sector. Partners like Microsoft are committed to being a trusted ally in that process because together, through more data collaboration, we can drive inclusive societal and economic impact in the region. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Marcus, for the insightful presentation. Well, we're very happy to have you here today. So since you're here, can I grab you very quickly and ask you some questions from our audience? So I'm seeing like a couple of audience, uh, couple of questions coming in. So if we take a look at the screen over there, we have our first question. When has data collaboration across businesses been the most successful? It's such an important question. And I think the first thing I'd say is a discussion like today's one is such a great opportunity to hear what has worked. And the panel discussion we'll have later is going to generate all sorts of interesting insights. A couple of points that come to mind for me. I think the first is this idea of starting with some principles before mm -hmm. jumping into the nuts and bolts of how are we going to share data, what data, what technologies are we going to be using. It's important for organisations that want to collaborate using data to set out the goals, to set out the principles that they want to achieve. And that then makes it easier to get through the practical steps that they need to. So starting with a principled approach is really important. And the second that I'd highlight is looking at learning from what's been done before. Now, we talk about, for example, the use of these standard uh, data agreements that are being published more and more. Organisations don't have to reinvent the wheel and start from scratch. They can leverage these practices that are out there to make the journey easier. So starting with a principled approach and making sure to learn from others and draw on what's already out there. Well, that was really, really insightful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I think that uh, our audience are very appreciative of, you know, the, uh, the tips that you shared with us as well. So uh, we have a couple more questions, but uh, in, in view of time, we do have a lot of very interesting presentations coming our way as well. So thank you so much, Marcus. It was lovely to speak with you today. And we can't wait to see you back again here soon. Thanks very much. And Take good care, luck for the rest Marcus. of the conference. I look forward to it. Thank you. And next up, I would like to invite Dr. Kevin Cheong, adjunct faculty from Singapore Management University and Singapore Institute of Technology, to present his research insights on leisure tourist considerations in the new COVID norm. I'm certainly excited to find out how the thinking and behaviours of inbound visitors to Singapore are changing with COVID. Now, you guys know the drill. If you have any questions for Kevin, please send it in via the Q&A function and he will answer them right after his presentation. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Kevin. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, welcome all. Um, thank you also, STB, for having us to share our uh, hopefully insightful research on leisure tourist considerations, especially in this very new and probably um, unprecedented times. This piece of research was done with my colleague from SMU uh, and SIT, Dr. Josephine Tan. Let me just jump straight into it. The most important question which bugged us, and both of us are practitioners as much as we are academics, we were asking this question, how has COVID shaped or impacted leisure travellers? A very bugging question. And hence, we went round to kind of design a, a survey and we started to ask these questions. And a little bit of a background, we conducted this about second half of last year and from various types of databases, uh, airlines, travel agents, NTOs, uh, we collected about 775 respondents, qualified respondents. And for the purpose of this particular uh, presentation, let us focus a bit more on that 40%, 300, sorry, 60%, which is uh, 467 non-Singaporeans, right? Which is essentially the inbound tourists, potential inbound tourists into Singapore. Now, let me just hold back a bit and tell you this. I'm not going to go down the data side and crunch the numbers with you. Well, I'll glean over it, but I want to focus more on the findings, right? So out of this 467, respondents, non-Singaporeans respondents, we saw that they had certain demographics, right? They were about 35 to 54 years old, a bit more senior. Many of them are married. All of them were very well educated and very qualified people. And they spread across the world. Yeah. Now, first set of questions we asked. Was there a difference between how they traveled before COVID and what will they be choosing in terms of the travel patterns post-COVID, right? And here are some of the questions. And essentially, certain questions like, what would motivate them uh, to travel? What would be their primary motivator? 
And later on, we'll be asking also a few questions like, what's the average length of stay and how much would they spend? Looking at these numbers, again, I won't bore you on the numbers, but the key findings here are about 44% of the, of the respondents said wellness. Wellness was the primary motivator for their leisure travel. 47% of them were unsure when their next travel might be. Now, looking at the, comparing the before and after, you could see that there's a drop in the propensity for medium trips or medium haul trips, which is five to seven days, and it spread more towards the long, long stays of eight days or more. The propensity to spend went up, especially in the categories of 500 US per day and above. And let me quantify that the 500 US per day was not inclusive of airfare. Yeah? And there is a greater propensity for business and first class uh, travel. Then we looked at this body of numbers and said, can we now look into three broad categories of travelers? Short stay, up to four days, medium stay, five to seven days, and long stay, which is eight days or more. And one of the key things that is very consistent is this wellness as a primary motivator. About 50% of the medium and short stayers were looking at wellness as a primary motivator. And I think this is something worth for us to consider. We went on and looked again at that spending patterns, right? And the key thing here is short stayers are more likely to spend more money and want to stay longer. And like I said earlier, the, the medium stayers now opting either a little bit more towards the, the shorter stays, but a lot more moving towards the longer stays. Now, the very interesting part is, to me, as a researcher, the long stayers were more prepared to spend more. Now, that's very interesting because you compound the length of stay with the average spend going up, which means more money spent in the destination. As, oh well, you guys are the travel experts. I think you know what I'm talking about. Now, then we asked another question. How would COVID affect their sentiments towards traveling. And we ask questions more on things like travel restrictions, movement restrictions, and infection levels, vaccination levels. Now, very consistently throughout the three groups of short, medium, and long stayers, that they were very concerned about travel and movement restrictions, and also infection and vaccination levels, especially in their intended destinations. Uh, this, of course, I mean, intuitively, we would say, of course. But now, empirically, we have the evidence for this. Last set of questions we asked. Well, no point having being able to travel. What would excite you as a traveler? What were your destination considerations? We asked them a range of questions from price to types of experiences, whether it's outdoor, nature, culture, shopping. Uh, destination appeal, and all kinds of issues, right? And also the willingness to spend and willingness to pay. Yeah. Now, again, I'm not going to go through the numbers, right? Let's get straight down to the findings. The findings are clear. There's a stronger desire for nature-based experiences. Travelers are looking for local culture, food, they want local experiences, which are diverse, exotic as well. Now, a couple of interesting findings from our research that travelers are increasingly more careful and they are more concerned about sustainability issues. Sustainability like economic impact to the society, care for nature, okay, and protecting Mother Earth. Yeah? Now, as much as they're looking for very varied and, and culturally diverse experiences, they're also quite neutral about pre-planned and arranged itineraries. They're neutral and indifferent. Now, this is something which we need to think about. Are they more the free and easy type? Now, then we start to ask certain questions from the findings. We, we looked and said, short stayers are a lot more price conscious. 
but they're also more attracted to outdoor activities, a bit of shopping and entertainment. However, long stayers were looking for nature-based experiences, very local, exotic, and cultural experiences. So these are broadly what our findings were. Now, of course, as practitioners, you'll be asking, Kevin, what do all these things mean to Singapore as a destination and to the tourism businesses in Singapore? Well, this is a proposition. Not my recommendation, just a proposition as a, well, finding from our research. As a destination, yes, sustainability is much closer in our hearts, especially with the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals with COP26. And the whole movement towards um, carbon footprint, carbon neutrality, and also about preserving our natural resources. Service is a critical component uh, of delivering a great experience. Being able to immerse ourselves in local experiences is something that will make us different. But fundamentally, there are also what I call hygiene factors of safe, safety, cleanliness, and security of Singapore, which we are very well known of. But we need to be mindful about communicating our travel and movement restrictions. Now, this is a major concern of all travellers. They do not want to go to a place where it's a lockdown. Okay, sorry, it's also called circuit breaker in Singapore. But also at the same time, they want to come here and have a good time. Yeah? But looking at the various experiences they're looking for, Singapore needs to pre present itself beyond just a city or city-state. We need to move and start to look at how can I combine my experiences from a metropolis together with nature and resort lifestyles and also culture, especially in our cultural precincts. But wellness is something which we need to look into as well. Yeah? Now, you might ask now, what does this mean to the industry? Well, constantly, we need to remind and also be top of mind with all our visitors that Singapore is safe, secure, and clean. But we also need to remind them that they will have a good time here. And so that's something which we need to constantly engage with our audiences, our markets overseas, especially with today's social media. And looking at how we can evolve this, could this be a role for our travel agents and tour operators to provide them that security, that, that sense of, of uh, comfort that they are taken care of. Now, there's a, the other part about the richness of experience. Can Singapore provide this? How can we do this? So that when we go deeper into the experiences, we are now offering a much longer stay for our tourists. How can we provide that whole myriad of experiences from culture to wellness to nature and outdoor experiences? And lastly, lastly, how can we now combine our multiple experiences into one visit? Twinning. And I borrow a term from my dear friend, Arthur. He talked about it uh, recently. How can we twin our uh, precincts? Metropolis with Sentosa's resort, culture. I think one of the things that I want to end off is let us allow our tourists, our travellers, to take their time to enjoy Singapore. Let's not rush them through some itinerary. Let them immerse themselves, indulge and discover Singapore. Just like how all of us have for the past two years. With that, thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. I really enjoyed your presentation. It was very lively and you gave us such great insights. So Kevin, naturally, because your presentation is so engaging, we've got a couple of questions coming your way. So let's take a look at them, shall we? Uh, the first one we have here is, what is your research definition of wellness? Ah, oh. that's an excellent question. Wellness is not just about the awum, okay, that we, we are so familiar with. Wellness is also about recalibration, mm -hmm. about getting back to lose yourself to discover yourself. Yeah? Oh, I like that so, a lot. So it's about being immersive. It's about spending quality time with the family as well. 
right? And there's also another part of wellness, which is a lot more than just about the womb and the yogas, but it's also about, well, trying to detox ourselves from IT a little bit, right? And we've got we're too much with, with IT around this. So from that perspective, wellness is a very wholesome thing. Yes, there's also another aspect of spiritual wellness, but that was something which um, we didn't quite ask. I do agree with you. I mean, especially now, everybody's been uh, so familiar with Zoom. Too familiar with Zoom, in fact. I feel like I don't really need to tell everybody uh, what to do too much. They already know which functions to click on. Yes. Uh, but thank you so much, Kevin. It's been a, a pleasure to, you know, sit in and listen to your presentation. And I'm sure that our audience are also enjoying themselves very, very much. And we hope to see you again, definitely back here again, Kevin. Thank you so much, Fiona. Take care. Thank you. So right now, I have another question for the audience. It's time for a poll, so let's bring it up to the screen. Now, what are your plans in preparation for tourism recovery? Now, there's a few options for that. I do not have any plan or clue on this. I do not have any data to work on. I have just started to collect some data on my customers. I have been collecting many data, but unsure if they are useful. I am already working on my plans based on the insights that I have. Let's give everybody some time to, you know, pick your options. I'm seeing uh, a lot of questions coming in from the chat box. Uh, don't worry because some of our presenters will be back later during the panel discussion and that is where you can also send in more questions. And if time allows, uh, our moderator will be taking them and asking them to our panelists. Okay, let's end the poll and take a look at um, what everybody's answers are. Uh, about uh, 8%. There are two 8% uh, who do not have any plans, uh, don't have any data to work on. Um, but most of you, 59% uh, are saying that I am already working on my plans. That's wonderful. And uh, I, I don't know if you guys do remember that you did a pre-event survey and I'm happy to share the survey results with you. To refresh your memory, the question is, how willing are you to collaborate and share data with other tourism partners on a scale of 1 to 10? 1 being least willing and 10 being most willing. So as you can see uh, on the bar chart on your screens, if we close the poll, you can see it. Okay, uh, most of you rated six and above. So nearly 70% of you are willing to do so. And that's really, really great news. I'm happy to know that. All right, so moving on to our next part of today's conference. You might not know this, but we actually have a team of lovely graphic recorders working behind the scenes to summarize the learnings from this conference for you. And they will be sharing, uh, that will be sent to you along with the conference materials as a quick recap. So you can feel free to also share these with your colleagues as well. So let's take a few moments to appreciate their beautiful work. Our next segment is a panel discussion titled Collaborating Through Data Sharing. With us, we have our panelists from four key associations. We have Dr. Kevin Cheong, Chairman of ASA, Mr. Stephen Le, President of NATAS, Mr. Richard Ireland, Acting President of SECOS, Mr. Arthur Kyung, First President of SHA. And we have Dr. Josephine Tan, adjunct faculty from Singapore Management University and Singapore Institute of Technology, who will be our panel moderator. So if you have any questions along the way, please type them into the Q&A function and we will try to incorporate them into our discussion. So welcome all to our panelists and handing time over to you, Josephine. Thank you very much, Fiona. Appreciate that. So we all know that in this era of data, simply having data is not sufficient. So what we want to do is to dive into what data actually means and how it can provoke action as well. So us having this holistic approach to data in terms of data sharing actually allows us to obtain more insights from different perspectives. We know that this is possible and it is important for us to do it 
for our tourism industry here. So we hope to be able to cite through all these challenges to understand the challenges that we face across different sectors in tourism industry. So Mr. Richard, for your industry, while it is a very focused one on business travelers in terms of exhibitions and conferences, at the same time, it is also very varied as you have different venue organizers and suppliers as well. So how do you work through challenges like this to collect your data? I think the first biggest challenge, of course, is around customer permission. If we're going to collect data and we're going to share data, we really have to ask the customers whether they're comfortable in that um, mm -hmm. because the customer's data and privacy is utmost important. There are obviously laws and, um, that go around that uh, permission piece and we need to be very respectful for that. A second challenge that we have is really around how do we collect data or what I like to talk about is the taxonomy of data. Mm. How do we have consistent data so therefore the data points that we're looking at um, is relevant around all certain areas. And I think really the third key area uh, that's a challenge is around trust. Mm. We're all in very competitive businesses while we all want to see our industry do well right. and, uh, and, and Singapore do well. Um, the, the issue of trust, how, do I trust who I'm sharing my data with? I think these are the major challenges that we face when it comes to data sharing. All right. And what about from the other sectors of tourism, perhaps, um, Atta? Well, I think Do the you... hotel industry is certainly, uh, we are no stranger to uh, using data. And in fact, uh, because I represent the association mm. and there's such a wide spectrum of hotels, um, I think the way we uh, use data is very, very different from mm. uh, the hotels that are, that are functioning at the uh, uh, upper end of the market versus mm. the, the, the hotels that are functioning at the lower end of the market. Mm. But primarily, we use data for accounting and analysis. As you can appreciate, a hotel is an extremely complex organism. Right. So if you're looking at customer data, mm. uh, we are using customer data to, to, to figure out what is the best uh, channel and what is the, or, or rather, what is the mm. highest rated channel and what right. is the lowest cost channel in order for us to invest our marketing, marketing dollars into, mm. right? That's one, one aspect where data is being used. The other aspect where data is being used is how can we improve our productivity? Right. So data is being used across mm. uh, different uh, operation mm. functions in terms of how you schedule for manpower. Mm. It's being used, how do you uh, 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 wear your, uh, uh, breakdowns and your breakages are mm. occurring. Right. And you're trying to use all this data not only to uh, uh, serve today's uh, business, but to predict uh, when things will malfunction mm. and break down, when peaks and valleys, mm. right. because the, 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 the business is, is highly dynamic and complex. Mm. But I think in the using of uh, guest data, mm. I just wanted to um, echo what Richard has mentioned. Um, we are obsessively afraid of contravening uh, PDPA right, right. as well as contravening uh, CCS, which mm. is the competitive, uh, uh, the competitive uh, mm. um, regulations. You know? mm. uh, the thing is, hoteliers generally, in, is, as a practice of past, mm. would every day, the first thing that we do in our mm. morning meetings would be to say, what was our occupancy right. and what's the competitor's occupancy? Yes, yes. And what's our rate versus what's the competitor's <coughs> rate? Right, right. And therefore have a gauge uh, to know uh, whether or not um, we are performing well or not. So it's, uh, our performance is, uh, is you know, we, we used to do that, right? Mm. We can't do this now. It's very, it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a highly sensitive topic. So we have to use public uh, uh, sources. So you're talking about data that is much older, mm, you know, right. instead of data that is real time. You just right. call your, your, your friend at the front <laughs> office uh, on the other side and say, hey, what did you guys do last night? And they, of course, lie to us and we lie to them. <laughs> but the thing is, as long as you lie consistently, right, you're able right. to kind of understand what is, the, what is the delta in terms of where your position and your okay. rate float. But you no longer are able to do that. So I think, uh, you know, we are, we're, we're, in terms of sharing our data, I, mm. I would not be uh, among the 70% the, the, the that's so ready to let's all share data. We, we have to be very careful about the regulations of uh, what we are 
uh, you know, whether we are, we, are, we are contravening any regulation. But nice. uh, lastly, I just wanted to make, I just want to tell a funny story about, uh, about data. In, in my previous association, mm -hmm. looking at the data, right. we were very, very excited because we have a customer who is coming to stay for his 50th visit. Mm. So the whole hotel in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the morning briefings is, do you know that Mr. Jones is coming? Uh, Jones, not his real name. I'm just uh, using it as an anecdote. You know, uh, the, our data tells us that he's, uh, the hotel hasn't been open really that long. It's been mm. open maybe about two years. Right. And he's here for his 50th visit. So we calculated mentally, he's here like once every two weeks, you know. Mm. The guy must really love us, you know. So we, 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 we looked at his company, we looked at his, uh, you know, his profile. And you know what? We rolled out the red carpet for the guy. Mm -hmm. uh, champagne. We had a, 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 a bathrobe made in his name. <laughs> a box of cigars because <clears throat> you know he enjoys cigars. Right, it was right. in the days where cigars are allowed and you are not jailed for smoking. So, so it was, uh, it was, we rolled out the red carpet and we really took care of the guy. And the guy was very well known. He was the, v the VIP when he came through in the hotel. Mm. Years later, when uh, we got into some uh, procurement problems with, uh, with his company, because uh, his company no longer wants to use our hotel because our rates have gone up too high, mm. we, we said, let's, I mean, we know this guy. He loves us, right? He stayed with us like, by now it's like 300 times. Mm. Let's, let's ask for his help and see what he can do to mitigate. Mm. And we found out that while his title was very, very high up, he's nothing more than a courier. He he career documents up and down between Hong Kong and Singapore. And that's the reason why he's here every two weeks. So he's a nobody. But, you know, nobody ever, ever found out. Nobody ever asked the question. We just assumed that the more customers that... So the thing is, data in itself mm. is not enough. You have, you've got to have insights mm. and you have to have hypotheses in order to test what you do with this data. And if you really took care of him and roll up the red <coughs> carpet, does it really generate more business? And does it really build loyalty? And in this particular case, we spent all that money, built, it builds zip royalty, okay? There was no loyalty. He just shook his hand and says, you know, tomorrow if my company says I stay in Hotel X, I just go and stay in Hotel X. But thank you for the champagne and the robe and the, and the, and the box of cigars. You know? Right, right. <laughs> and what about for yourself, Stephen? What are the challenges you face as, an, as a travel operator? Um, I think for travel agents, mm. uh, I think today we have different uh, segments of travel agents mm. with a global large travel agency, which right. I would say they are more well prepared in terms of the data, mm. mining and the capabilities. Um, then we have our local large agency and of course the smaller mid-sized mm. agency. So from that different segments of agency, there's different ability to generate data mm. that we look at. Right. Um, so again, the usage of data also varies. Mm. And I think when we look at pre-COVID, the data source where the inbound or outbound agent look at is primarily, I would say, very demographic-driven data. Mm, right. uh, very standard data like the mm. length of stay, the typical family yes. size, um, uh, the, the amount that they're likely to spend. Mm. And the kind. So those were the data point where a lot of travel agencies use mm. that as a point of uh, identifications and mm. decide how would they treat different customer segments as mm. arriving from the destinations that mm. we can get. So those are the data I would say may vary a lot in mm. the last two years. So those are the data points that may not be repeated right. moving forward. And uh, with all the changes we're looking at here is also how relevant are these data mm. moving forward. So, um, and a lot of travel agencies, and I think that's something we also be very mindful where we talk about relevance of mm. data, right. is different agency has different requirements. How do you mm. apply the data usage? Um, are you using it for marketing intent? Mm. Or are you using data to develop specific products uh, development to, mm. to reach out to the segment of customer? Right. Or you're just uh, collating data to help to optimize your revenue? So I think the, the data points are also very important to how agency use that. Mm. And I think today the challenges that the agency are facing mm. primarily is there's no consolidations of right. data. Everybody is building their little piggy banks of data <laughs> where they only apply to themselves and it may not be something that would be the same moving forward. I think those are the challenges they are facing today. Okay, thank you. And Kevin, how about on your end, attraction site? Well, <clears throat> in Singapore, let's, let's start with Singapore, which is mm. home-based, right? Um, we've got almost one of everything. And in that sense, we are quite unique, uh, whether it's outdoor, indoor, uh, playgrounds, and, and theme parks. Having said that, 
right? Um, one of the things that we might have a problem with is we treat each other like competition. Mm. And I'll put it up front, right? And we're all trying to kind of sneak in the couple hours from the tourists and, and have a share with not only his time, but also his wallet mm. because of this very compressed uh, itineraries, mm. right? So it's this fight for time and, and dollars. But having said that, right, and uh, I'll, I'll share with something which I experienced in, in uh, Smoky Mountains in the States, mm. right, in Tennessee. And, and um, there's this, it's a funny place called Pigeon Forge and, and that's where Dolly, Dollywood is and I've got a couple of clients there, um, our Titanic uh, attractions. They share the data. And so what they do is they, they kind of load balance and say, do dynamic pricing. Early in the morning, how can we run specials? How can we, do, how can we bring in uh, maybe some of the bargain hunters to come in during off-peak times mm. and off-peak seasons? And, and that's something I hope our attractions business can come in together. Mm. Uh, but having said that, we do share quite a fair bit of, um, well, not so much data, but insights. That we know that a certain family likes certain products. We kind of share and kind of work together with the travel agent and even with the hoteliers on the island, mm. on Sentosa, to say, how can we now curate an itinerary that can excite the whole family, mm. right? So, so, but I like to... From, from the attraction standpoint, I think that should be something a lot more formal. Mm. Um, not just treating each other as competition, but really con co collaborating and increase that fun mm. quotient uh, from, right. for our guests. Yeah, if I may just jump into what uh, Kevin has, has just said. Uh, data is very sensitive, especially when it is uh, in a competitive environment. Right. But sharing data is not uh, sensitive if it is for a sustainability uh, cause, you see. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, there is much that we can do in terms of promoting and, and, and sharing, sharing our data in terms of how we can uh, promote the sustainability cause. La. And uh, the promotion of the sustainability cause, I think in the case of Singapore, uh, what threatens us more than climate change uh, mm. is manpower crunch. So, <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, uh, really, I, I was, uh, you know, uh, toying with the idea mm. whereby if all hotels can 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 band together, so so called to say that you know what, we are uh, wanting to involve our guests to say it's to it to onto our sustainability cause, mm. and if you are prepared to give up a day of housekeeping because you're staying here for three days, four days, mm. we'll donate that amount that we save on housekeeping to offset carbon footprint or to grow mm. a tree yeah. or to do something sustainable, mm. and then we share the data of what kind of profile of customers would nice. would 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 likely go for that. Or what kind of customers will say, are you crazy so that we get better at it? And, you know, to, uh, through the process, uh, learn how to uh, involve customers in uh, our sustainability uh, cause. That would be an example for, uh, that would be an example of using data, mm -hmm. sharing data to say what works and what doesn't work and don't try it with that customer. They, they, they're going to throw eggs in your face. <laughs> and, and, you know, likely that we should do it in this way or how we phrase it and do A-B testing. Um, I just wanted to just jump on that about, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's not always a competitive situation. There are, mm -hmm. uh, actually, for, for the survivability of the industry and for us to pivot to quality tourism, there needs to be far more collaboration than competition. Mm. Yes. Right, right. So it appears that across different sectors, all of you do collect data. But how much do you actually use? How much do you actually leverage on? to actually understand your consumers out there to improve your business? Well, may, may, maybe I can just jump in to say that uh, maybe that's the reason why everybody just have their own data. <laughs> because it, you collect data with an end in mind. Yeah. And uh, so, so if you're collecting data with an end in mind, so I'm collecting sketches or I'm collecting, uh, I'm using a metaphor, I'm collecting sketches or I'm collecting drawings with my end in mind, because I want to compile a particular book. Mm. If I were to share my sketches and my, mm. and my drawings with somebody else, they will look at that and say, okay, thank you for that. It's very interesting, but it has no relevance to me because I'm not coll collecting sketchings. I'm collecting poems because I've got a different... So data is a little like that. Mm. We all tend to not want to share data because we are collecting the data for a particular purpose. Mm. And, um, and, 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 and what purpose would that be? Because generally, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a loop in mm. terms of how you use data. Right. There's the accounting and the analysis, mm. which is what everybody uses for their own purposes. That, right. that you can have some sharing. But then you, 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 you're collecting uh, data to gain insights. Mm. And people have different insights. My, 
insight to my business will be different from mm. uh, mm. uh, uh, Richard's insight to his business. Well, firstly, because we're in not only is tourism just a, uh, in one bucket, but my says, and hospitality is quite different. And mm. even in our <coughs> hospitality business, there are so many different types of hotels. So the data may not be relevant mm. and different people get different insights. But apart from insights, uh, the last part, part portion of the cycle is, so do you dare to use the data to take action mm. and test? And, and, and what is the recording of what's the result you get? Mm. Now, that's a very individual mm. thing. So what, what are some examples of that? Data will give you some intuitively different answers mm. to what you think is, is, is. Like for example, right? In a, using a marketing example, I tell my digital marketing team, why do you keep showing the picture of a room with a bed, you know? That, that is just the most asinine thing because the customer surely knows that every room comes with a bed and it right. all looks right. a pretty picture. Why don't you show, uh, you know, lifestyle shots, you know? And the, and the digital marketing manager looked at me, it's like, you think I'm stupid or what? Of course I did. I have done testing with data that when we do lifestyle shots, mm. we don't get as much bookings and traction than we actually show just your usual vanilla room shot. And that is surprising to me. Mm. And then, so, so you're using data to decision-making and using A-B testing. And then from there, we learn that, you know what, it depends on what end of the funnel you are. When you are at the high end of the funnel, you're probably attracted by the pretty lady and the family with the picnic basket, the lawn. You're attracted to those kind of lifestyle mm. pictures. But when you're right down to making a decision of what room type, you want to see the room, man. You want to see what the bed look like. And, you know, you're, you're getting right down to the product, you see. Wow. And so, that was insightful. But you need to use data to, to act. So it's acting with the data. And then it goes back into a learning loop. Mm. And different teams like hotels, different hotels have different levels of sophistication right. on how they use data. And you cannot paint them with the same brush. Right. So it seems like you use a lot of it for insights for your marketing, right? To get into the mindset. Productivity of as well. Yeah, productivity. productivity as well. Right. Okay. In terms of how do uh, people react to tasks. What Sorry. About? There is a real opportunity. I mean, competitive pressures aside, that as industries, we can use data for, for greater good. I mean, certainly during the COVID period, it was very important uh, for our sector um, when we did pilot events to demonstrate through data that events were a safe, um, safe for everyone to yes. attend. Now, if the data was not shared, um, the collective good of the industry wouldn't be realised. Mm. I think another example is in our industry, historically, um, a lot of data is shared around the scale of a show, how many square metres mm. versus right, right. how many attendees, Te which right. is Technical. really quite poor data, mm. where really as an industry, if we're sort of talking about recovery, we really want to talk about <laughs> satisfaction. So <laughs> high satisfaction scores or effective cha uh, market channels. Mm. And I think you can only really do that if you share which is not competitive per se, right. but you can really um, position your industry as an industry of strength if, if you share um, mm. more macro data rather than right. customer data. Right, right. So it seems like the metrics that you decide on, what you want to use it for, is important as well. Absolutely. If not, it's just insignificant information. You're just doing it for the sake of doing data collection, That's right? right? And Stephen, what about on your end? Um, I think... Clearly, moving forward, we definitely need some form of data collect, uh, collaborations. Mm. Like I mentioned early on, we see fragments of data and right. we see even uh, in different space, be it hotel, be it attraction, we have all data points. Mm. So, um, I think the intent of this uh, uh, leadership forum where we want to talk about is how potentially we can consolidate some of this right. learning curve that we have yes. uh, on the ground. Uh, how do we extract some of this insight from mm. our agents, mm. uh, from our association members to collate that data right. so that it provides us a deeper insight of uh, what are we expecting moving forward. Like mm. I said earlier on, I think uh, even the data that we're looking on a quarterly basis mm. is changing quite a lot. Mm. So even when I talk about uh, when we look at our own data during the opening of VTL mm. back in yeah. September right. to now, the data point for the last three months versus the forward three months is totally different. Mm. Um, we see people moving out a lot more uh, traveling. Uh, they're more willing. And some of the, the things that will also change in the customer behavior, such as uh, they prefer more free and easy mm. versus uh, organized. As much as we thought organized would be a safer, 
but hence it's not. And people mm. are uh, preferencing to book better quality hotel. Mm. Mm. So some of this insight is something we don't get the data pre-COVID. Mm. And we cannot assume that historic data will give us that same trending moving forward. Right. And I think the, the, the challenge now is how do we extract such knowledge and insight from different agents because we have different customer pool mm. to build that into something that is meaningful that we can then share that data on a broad mm. spectrum across different associations. Hopefully, we can find some mm. commonalities from there mm. and help us to come up with something that we can actually build up to, I will call that a, a I know, rediscover Singapore product mm. that help us to attract because we know our customers. We heard what our customers are telling us right. by getting real insight from our agents and our members. Right. So what about on the attractions and would leveraging on this data help you with the business as well? Definitely. Mm. Well, for starters, attractions, we can't ask the guy to show us a passport. So we don't have a lot of demographic data. Mm. Unlike the hotels and travel agents, right. probably minds you have a bit of profiling. You're moving <coughs> blood type and genetic, uh, <laughs> uh, gen Boy, genetic I sample. I don't know, yeah. right? Um, so, so from that perspective, we use the, the, the guesstimate or the agaration mm. method, right? Is he from Sri Lanka, India or Pakistan? You know, mm. kind of thing, right? So, but that I think is, is good. But from my perspective, um, looking at it from an attraction, mm. we... We, we only know that two hours he's with us. Mm. We don't know more than that. But we can curate a lot more experiences right. if all of us actually, all of us have a different perspective to the same person. Whether it's a hotel guest or whether it's a travel agent, mm. he's coming for a business travel or he's coming to, to, for an attraction. Then from there, we can start to paint a 24-hour picture mm. times X number of days and say, what would this family want? Mm. What would mm. this person want? And I think that's where a much more wholesome um, experience, mm. a destination experience. Right. And that will help us also curate things like, in the morning, maybe we can have a certain type of engagement mm. in the zoo. I'm sorry, Mike, uh, I'm using your place as an example. <laughs> right? And then in the afternoon, we could have another a show and tell. in the eve So we can start to vary mm. our product because we know the profile better. Mm. You know, what you've touched on, which is a very important point about this, uh, this, this in, a very relevant point, mm to this particular conference is that common sense must prevail yes. rather than just to be completely reliant on data, mm. right? Yes. And, and, an, and an example is, when you look at, a ho and talking about hotels, right? When you look at hotels, sometimes there are some hotels that have uh, a in, innately a large proportion of Singaporeans mm. when you look at their customer mix, you know? Mm. And you look at the hotel, you say this, this, this clearly is not the case, but right. why would it be that Singaporeans constitute something like 17%, it's, which is a very large number. When you mm. see that mm. the hotels cater primarily to, uh, uh, say, tour groups. Mm. Okay? And um, the reason is because of uh, the data is not uh, the, 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 what you call the… Be all and all. Be all and end all or the, or the gospel. You know? okay. you know, I wanted to use the word gospel. <laughs> uh, you know, because it, it was the default when you really don't know where they're right. from. Because, right. uh, and, and so the default, they just put default, right? So default, Singapore is the default. So therefore, it gives you a slanted view of where to, where to focus your attention to. The other thing is, just because a guy holds a British passport doesn't mean that he's living in London. He could be holding a British passport, <laughs> but the source of booking is from Hong Kong. So source of booking is more important than nationality. So it's, so so it's like these insights and common sense, which is far more important than, you know, uh, what does the data tell you? What does the data right. tell you? And, and sometimes um, people use data to hide behind making the tough decisions. And I think that's a danger. Right. That, uh, you know, the, as we become more digitized, you know, mm. the, the, you know, this is what the data says, so please don't blame me. That kind of uh, mm. uh, allusion, you know, to that, uh, to that position. Whereas no innovation can be made with the data. You know? No data can tell you uh, what product to create. And Steve Jobs didn't Hold a customer uh, survey mm. group in order to right. create the iPod, you know. So, but at the end of the day, I think the human factor plays a large role here as well. It's not just about collecting data for the sake of it. You have to decide what to do with the data and what exactly mm. are you collecting as well, right? Sometimes, of course, the easiest way out is just to put the default option, right? You can't blame the employees for doing that because. Now that we have labor crunch, we have no time to do anything beyond that. That could be the easiest way out. Well, right. Let me jump in mm. and, and say this. I think what, what Arthur said about common sense mm. 
is very true. Mm. Um, I use data. I encourage people to use data, right. especially people like me who have been in the industry long enough, has been mm. doing the same thing for a long time, is to use data to satisfy your intellectual curiosity mm. and go beyond intuition. Absolutely. Mm. Right? But use your experience <clears throat> to gain insights, to slice and dice it more and say, can I see some peculiarities out of this data set? Mm. Data is binary. It's black and white. Mm. But we need to use our experience, our gut feel as much as, as common sense, mm. but also about taking that step and say, is this indicative of the future? And we should also try. So some form of experimentation must take place. Mm. Don't just hide behind the data. And on the subject of experimentation, you know, uh, data doesn't have to come about because of some sophisticated software or computer program. Uh, there was a question that was asked in my, again, a previous mm. association whereby, do we know whether we're going to offer the customer a choice of an upgrade or free breakfast? Do we know whether they will take the upgrade or they'll take mm -hmm. the free breakfast. We, we pray to God they will, they will take the upgrade because it costs us nothing. If they choose the breakfast, oh, done. You know, it costs us food costs, right? So breakfast was a far more expensive option. So we, we wanted to test mm -hmm. the, uh, the hypothesis. Where would, what would the customer lead <clears throat> when we require data? Mm -hmm. So we said, well, we, do, we, we don't really have a software to be able to, to uh, uh, do that. Mm -hmm. And the guy says, there's no need for a software or a new, mm -hmm. but you don't have to write a program. Just use the chicken scratch method, you know. Would you prefer upgrade or yes, breakfast? Right. Breakfast, okay. You will upgrade, okay. And then after three days, you say, well, we sampled uh, 100 customers and out of the 100 mm. customers, 70% wanted an upgrade. Oh, phew. That's a good decision. Okay, then, you know, we right. can continue with the program. So sometimes it's the common sense yes. of, mm. let's, as long as you account and you analyze, the, the math, you know. Yes. Uh, when we talk about uh, data, it doesn't mean it has to be some fancy, schmancy right. software program that is no. extremely complicated. I totally agree, you know, and, and mm. after you, this is a, a friend of mine and, and many people in the attractions industry would know him. He's a master storyteller called Bob Rogers. He designs many attractions and he says, he calls this a Sharpie method, right? You don't know what promotions will work. <laughs> Take out a piece of paper, take a Sharpie, 25% off this hour. Try it out. Mm. <laughs> Try it out. If nobody right. buys, change it to 35. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it seems like each of the different sectors have your own way of collecting data and a different set of insights for your consumers as well. So the big question here is, is there any way for you to share data across the different sectors here? So you have a more holistic view of that tourists coming into Singapore? And hopefully, you can increase the tourist experience or service quotient so that he has a better impression of what Singapore has to offer him. In the mice industry, for instance, do you think that's possible to share across all? And I think it's important. I think it is possible. I mean, technologically, it's po impo right. possible. But I think it's, it's for what end is what's really important. Right. Um, why would we do that? You know, if it's around um, enhancing um, customer satisfaction, um, and understanding pre-arrival versus what they actually did, that's really important. Mm. If it's about um, maybe ancillary revenue, giving mm. um, um, tourists an opportunity just to spend right. more. But I, I think, you know, if, if we have a massive data center, throw it all in and expect the answers to come out, we mm. might be a little bit disappointed. Mm. So I think it's very much around what outcome are we looking for right. and then what and how will data uh, help us mm. shape the strategy um, of what we want to achieve. And I think that is really the key. I mean, I was quite encouraged with the, um, to hear about this concept of twinning. Clearly, um, um, people will, will, will travel again and they will combine travel and leisure. And if there mm. is that opportunity to, to provide a more of a value add, right. so a higher value tourists or more ancillary revenue, we should take that opportunity. Absolutely. Great, great. What about travel operator? Um, I think um, definitely we, we need to have uh, something that we're going to focus on mm. in terms of uh, attracting customers back. Obviously, we want the whole world to come back tomorrow, uh, but ah, we know that's not going to happen. Um, so factoring that in, I think we also need to be focused and say, what type of customers do we really want to attract mm. in the next six months? Right, Given the fact that um, not every country is coming back in, mm. uh, not the regional, for example. If we want to attract the long haul, what, do we, what does it really take us to prepare to attract the long-haul customers. Mm. Remembering Singapore is, uh, is also uh, a twin city with mm. the regional. Mm. How do we facilitate that? Do we need to work with our counterparts, countries to formulate as a twin mm. city destination, a twin city product? Um, 
how do we do that? Mm. So again, it begs to the point, while we want uh, to focus on a key outcome, right. are we targeting the long haul? What does it take? Then I think we can build across the associations, be it the hotels, mm. attractions, to come up with the right product mix mm. to be able to attract this segment of customer, at least for the next six months we're looking at where the border reopening. Because right. like I said, things are so dynamic now, right? Uh, if we do something too generic, it may not meet the requirements right. uh, for the customers. Right. So from what I hear about attractions, it seems like attraction would benefit a lot if that's data sharing across, right? Because there's no way you can obtain passport to get even basic demographics. Yes. So it's all based on assumption on your end. Yes. So would this data collection across sectors help you to design or generate better insights? Well, a few things that we will use data. One, of course, to plan um, the experiences within our park mm. and work together with the ecosystem. When should we time that visit? Is it morning, afternoon, evening visits, for example? Mm. And like what uh, Arthur said, then we relate back to our productivity, our scheduling, manning ratios, and how do we scale up, scale down, mm. for example? Now, the other part about um, collecting data is, and I agree with the, the Richard mm. and, and Stephen, that we must have an end in mind. That are we profiling? Are we really now sh trying to shape mm. what is that future strategy? So then now, not just sharing data, in return, if we start to put in the data, what can we do as individual businesses tap on this direction? Right. Then I think we're very aligned, extremely aligned. And I strongly encourage everyone in the audience and all our industry partners and friends to come in because I think our, our friends in STB have invested tons, right? And they are a trusted partner, right? And right. so, but we need to help them to help ourselves. So it seems like this is pretty doable and across sectors, everyone seems to be willing to share. Well, not everyone. <laughs> to a certain, to a certain because, extent. A certain well, extent, I, I think uh, we, we I, I, I would say that, uh, I, okay, I've got to take off my uh, Singapore Hotel Association mm. hat, yeah, and I'm putting on uh, my hat as a, ah, uh, okay. as a as a as a business operator, and I would say that on a macro level, mm. uh, would we would we be better off if we had a holistic view of the tourist? Mm. Uh, it's like asking, uh, um, would you like motherhood and apple pie? The answer is yes. Obviously, from a holistic point of view, point of view, that that would be really great, but uh, from a from a practical day-to-day -day level and on a business level, having a much better holistic view of the tourists, mm. unless you're talking about something that is in real time and so effective in predicting a trend, it's not going to be helpful for me. Because if you mm. tell me a real holistic view of a tourist, he comes to Singapore, mm. he visited the zoo over the last four years, three times, he went to the panda cage and he spent the most time in the panda cage and I'm reading all this data. So what's the point? Yeah, what's the point for me? <laughs> so to, for my business, uh, uh, this is not uh, particularly helpful. So from an, right. this, from an operator. So now I put on the Shah hat again. Yeah. I'll say that from a Singapore tourist uh, a board point of view, from a macro point of view, mm. is that useful? Of course it is, <laughs> provided they know what the end game is. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we trust them and all that. But uh, knowing what to do with the data is, it's got to be more than trust, man. It's about vision, it's about courage, it's about uh, being able to sell ideas to the political uh, uh, masters that will be able to transform what we offer as a destination. So, it's a completely different right. uh, discussion, you know. Right. So what more do you think needs to be done to get everybody to come together as a whole? I think this is what is, is lacking, right? What, what more can be done? Well, for me, I, and I'd like to take on uh, um, Arthur's point, right? The problem with aggregation of data mm. is motherhood <coughs> statements. We end up watering it down so holistic that it doesn't mean anything. Correct. Mm. So we need to plant that stake in the ground and say, these are the profiles of long stayers, short stayers from whichever part. Right. And say, this is the product we're going to go for. Then we end up productizing it, then monetizing it. Yeah. Rather than giving hairy fairy stories yeah. without any direction. It's, it's like yeah. a, the, the, the situation we find ourselves in right now. What are the two key priorities for us? We have to, number one, we have to uh, try to keep the, 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 the first you've got to be uh, first, first to market, right? right? Because right now, as uh, Stephen had alluded to, the perception of the long-haul world is ASEAN is closed. That's a problem for us. We have to wave our hand and say, okay, ASEAN may be closed, but Singapore is not ASEAN. Singapore, mm. we have to uh, 
promote ourselves as a mono destination, something that we have never done before. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing we need to do is how can we extend the length of stay? Okay, so those are two objectives. Right. And then we use the data to support the objective, mm -hmm. not, not take on an action and then look at data and analyze data and, 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 and it could be this and it could be mm. that. And now that is uh, being uh, what I call a paralysis through analysis. <laughs> so data has a, 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 a danger right. of doing that to you because you know what? It tells you conflicting stories. Mm. So you can argue both ways. So mm. uh, I think we need a direction. I think right. we need to uh, promote ourselves as a mono destination and we need to figure out how to lengthen our visitor stay in order right. to survive the next two years before the world comes back to normality. So it seems like having a direction would help with data sharing across different sectors as well. And probably we need mm. to take, start by taking baby steps, mm -hmm. identify a key focus point that we want right. to do, right. uh, identify um, a templatized mm. uh, way of consolidating and building data. Then we find uh, willing parties, mm. members and agents to take the first step and say, we want to collaborate together, start small. Mm. Baby steps, build that small community, get people on board, and then we can start building the basic, the fundamentals, mm. and then I think we can take that step moving forward, and I think that's a learning curve that we all need to embrace yes. with all the association together. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing. And it seems like this is really possible, data sharing across industries, if everyone is willing to take the baby steps moving forward having an open mindset and deciding on what their end game is, the kind of data that they hope to retrieve and the kind of insights which they hope to obtain as well. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time here. I really appreciate it. And it's a great discussion we have here. Thank you. So, thank, you thank, thank you, Dr. You. Josephine. Thank you. Now, back to you, Fiona. A big thank you to our panelists, <coughs> Kevin, Stephen, Richard, Arthur, and our moderator, Josephine, for the lively discussion. We hope that this has inspired everyone to explore more data collaborations and be brave in taking steps towards data sharing. The points discussed during the panel discussion have been captured by our graphic recorders in the background beautifully. So we're going to share it with you on the screen right now. We can take a few moments to appreciate it. And next, I would like to invite Ms. Eileen Tan, Vice President, Digital Customer Experience and Analytics from Set Limited to share her presentation on creative value through data collaboration with airlines. Set has participated in at least two of STB's initiatives, the Data Analytics Shift Program, otherwise known as DASH, and the Singapore Tourism Accelerator Program. So you guys know the drill. If you have any questions for Eileen, you can also send it in via the Q&A function during her presentation. So please join me to welcome Eileen. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eileen. I'm very happy to be here today to share with you, you know, how we take the journey together with STB, creating value through data sharing and collaboration with the airlines. So um, just very briefly, you know, to give you a, a sense of what I'm going to share today. So I hope that most of you know who SET is, but I would still give you, you know, a, a quick introduction of who we are. And also the data analytics journey that we had kicked off since two, three years ago and where we are today. And of course, you know, um, let me share a bit about, you know, how we have benefited from STB's uh, program, especially the DASH and the acceleration program to bring us, you know, um, expediting our, our journey. I'll give you a bit of example, you know, the outcome of the program and also some of the use cases that we have started and benefiting from. So let me just start with, you know, who we are, you know. So SETS is actually the leading um, um, service provider, you know, for solutions, food solution and gateway services in Asia. We have presence in, you know, more than 50, 55 cities in 13 countries. And we are the incumbent ground handling um, provider in Changi Airport. Our biggest customer is Singapore Airlines. 
Um, so, like I say, we have presence, you know, in many cities in the world, covering both the aviation sector as well as the food sector. The largest, the latest uh, additions to our operation is the new airport in Beijing, the Taxing Airport. So, in the aviation sector, we basically handle and you know, help airlines to handle customers check-in, baggage handling, all the way to you know cargo handling, and you know connecting the, the community. Um, for, for example, e-commerce facility, e-commerce businesses. In the food area, uh, we are the incumbent providing in-flight catering to airlines, you know, handle more than 80% of the airlines in Changi Airport. Um, outside aviation, we are also a big uh, caterers for uh, institutional catering and also in the commercial sector. So, SETS actually started, you know, analytics um, journey two, three years ago preparing ourselves to become a digital-ready analytic company together with you know, the transformation in digital processes, automation uh, through technology. So, and, and COVID clearly have expedited the journey for us. Right? So where we are today is really you know, at, at the very beginning stage of leveraging, maximizing the benefit from data and analytics. We are expired to you know, move towards to an analytical company where using data to help business decision, operating efficiency, increasing productivity, um, you know, that become a habit in every part across the organization. So to do that, you know, clearly we need um, talent, right? So uh, in my team, so we built Center of Excellence for Data Analytics and Business Intelligence uh, capability centrally, but that is not enough to actually support, you know, 12,000 manpower company uh, across you know, so many different business units in sets. So we need to actually build a second layer of uh, you know, digital champion or data champion, data analytics to go together with us so that they can actually you know, have a much um, immediate, right, immediate adoption of analytics and, and self-help, especially for a day-to-day -day operation needs. So that's where you know, we started um, we sent you know, two teams to participate in STB's data analytics shift program, where they go through 10 weeks program, learning you know, all aspects about uh, data, all the way to you know, creating business uh, cases, uh, visualizing how data to be used, and of course use uh, data tools, methodology, as well as visualization tool to help them to understand the application of data. So that's the first program that we have participated in with STB. The second part of the program is called the accelerator program. So we actually, at back then, we have two problem statements. So the first one is really, I think that's have been talked a lot about, you know, how do we share data across, you know, di different companies uh, and how do we control data? How do we control pri data privacy? So that's our first statement, problem statement. Which, you know, I mean, most of the people would actually have faced that, that same challenge. Um, so we are looking for a solution where, where we actually allow you know, partners to come together, have the confidence to share uh, information for the bigger wins. So I'll talk a bit about that later. The second problem statement is about you know, detecting uh, trends in advance, you know, using data, technology, social media, research, and put you know, big data together and then be able to help us to actually look at what is up and coming. Uh, you know, based on consumer behavior and based on changes, you know, mega trend in the world. So let me start with, you know, I mean, so uh, with, with this um, business and then I'll, I'll talk about some of the use cases. So, um, you know, so we are the, the incumbent, you know, uh, ground handler in Changi Airport and one of the business that we handle is to provide uh, travel, in-flight travel retail, you know, for some of the, uh, the airline. In particular, you know, um, you can see that actually we, we provide the end-to-end -end, um, in-flight catering uh, and buy on board services for Jetstar, School, and other airlines. So what we do is that so we have a kitchen. We actually co-create the menu with the airline, you know, and we actually help them to, you know, to upload the, the food, the meals, the, the uh, merchants uh, onto the plane. Okay. So the immediate use case of uh, you know, data analytics right, is, um, is basically automating reporting. Right? If you do not have accurate 
data, accurate information, I think most of the time you can't you know, make um, a good decision or even understand where your business uh, performance is, right? So the very first thing is actually to take away manual work, give them a tool that where they can visualize, understand their business performance, uh, you know, in, in a you know, very, um, what they call, seamless, timely, and, and without, you know, manual intervention using Excel spreadsheet. So first thing is, I mean, immediately, you know, the benefit is the using visualization tool to help you to understand your businesses and cutting into different aspects of the businesses. For example, you can look at the business from the time point of view, from uh, you know, product point of view, from customer segment point of view, etc., etc. So that's the first thing, automating your sales report. Free out your people to do the brain work, but not the manual work. And accuracy, you know, I mean, you get, you know, you tend to eliminate errors and, and have tiny, you know, tiny uh, information provided for, for decision making. Okay, the second part is that, you know, when you have more information, you, you will be able to actually provide more options for business, uh, you know, benefiting your customers, benefiting your business, improving your, uh, your P&L, for example. So this is just one of the examples that, you know, when you have more information beyond just, uh, you know, what is on the menu, what, you know, what is being sold, you actually is able to look into who do you sell to, right? Which route sell the most? What's the difference between, you know, uh, the flight, the sales on the flight from Singapore to, to say, say, Sydney versus the one that go to Chongqing, for example. So there's tons of information over here that you are able to actually uh, understand your sales performance based on the demographic for particular route, for particular timing, for particular airline. And you, you know, you are able to actually improve the sales performance by benchmarking or by, you know, and allowed you to actually get us more information, ask for more information, ask for more data points to improve your business. Okay, so another use case is about so so you have the sales numbers. We have we we know you know how many cup noodles has been sold, how many you know coconut water is being sold. Um, but we need to you know we, we can actually use the data to understand that you know when people buy you know what are the most sold. Uh, product, that is one thing, but we also be able to actually find out more information. People that buy this normally will also buy another product to complement. So, in a way, we actually is able to provide, you know, new bundles, new, new packaging, you know, after the basket analysis. So, we, we actually sell more products, sell, increase the total transaction value per customer. So again, this one is very common in the e-commerce uh, world, you know, online. So we, we buy things from Lazada, Shopee, Redmart, uh, Amazon. So a lot of time, you know, you see that yeah, there's a special offer to you and, and you, you suddenly feel the suspicion, well, how come they know actually you're looking for a certain product, right? So we information, we more information sharing from the airline, you know, and then together with you know, historical data and inventory data, we, are, we, are, we will be able to actually create a few, uh, you know, um, Upselling, um, what they call methodologies, right? You know, for example, personalization or targeting selling. So the first example, you know, when you look at the customer ordering uh, application. So when you know, when maybe you know, two hours before the flight landed, we know that we have certain product has not been sold, especially the fresh food. So you want to actually, you know, no point actually bringing down, right? You know, taking back to to the warehouse. So basically, you can have an impromptu. Uh, flash sales just to clear your stock right before the flight ended. The second use case is that you know if you have customer information, right, and together you know by sharing information from the airline, you will be able to actually tell the crews that this is a repeat customer in the past. What the customer has been purchased, typically what you know at what time they will actually enjoy a beer, for example. So we can actually you know prompt the crew to actively approach the customer at, at the seats and, and then, you know, uh, provide the, his most favorite drinks or food. So how do we actually get there? You know, so we talk about all these use cases, but the most important thing is still where is the data? Right? Okay, so, I mean, earlier the panels, you know, discussed a lot about, you know, the right to share data, in what context we share the data, uh, and what are the challenges to share data, right? You know, so we face the same issue. Um, so you can see the actually sets, you know, because we handle the, the uplift 
of the food or uh, the, the merchandise onto the plane. So we, we control the inventory, right? So if we do not know, have, we don't have more data, basically you just pack the standard uh, you know, list of things, or a number of fixed number of you know, beers or, or Coca-Cola onto the plane, regardless of number of people in the flight. So that is not very efficient because, you know, I mean, to airline, one of the cost component is fuel. So if, if the heavier, you know, it is, then the more fuel is being burned, right? So ideally is to know how many passengers are going to be on that flight and we can actually just bring enough inventory to serve that particular flight. So we need, so we have the inventory, but, you know, we need more information to optimize the, the you know, the, the numbers of things to be put up. We have the sales, um, but we need to know, you know, who to sell to, right? You know, who, who to sell to. So that's where the airline partners, you know, uh, inf information will be very important to complement with what we have and then we'll create, a, you know, upsell opportunity. So we work with STB. We want to start out that in, in, from the accelerator program. So we work with the, you know, the startup to find a way to actually create a pseudo so in this sense, so technically, the data from the airline is not shared with SAT, and SAT do not transfer data over to the airline. So what we does is that we have this uh, application where you know, we actually go into individuals' uh, database, we create pseudo, we create persona, we get information just enough for our use case. The use case had to be very specific. It's not a blank check that, you know, we just go in and get whatever information, whether you call it encoding or what. So that is not the case. It's very use case specific. We know what we want to know. We, in this case, we, it's information we are extracting. We are not extracting data. So I don't need to know the passenger's name, email, mobile number. I don't have to. I don't even know, need to know who is this, exactly this person is. I just need to know that there's this person that have this characteristic that travel with this airline, Every time we travel with the airline, he buys certain things, he consumes certain things, you know. So that is the characteristic. They come with a pseudo character or persona. And that is the information, that's the knowledge that's being stored in the application. So the next time when the airline, um, we, before the next flight, you know, um, take off, if we receive, you know, the information, the manifest or the, the load factor information, the flight, his, the flight, um, yeah, passengers' information, we will be able to do a few things. So this is basically a POC that we did with uh, the startup, and then it's, it's actually a live POC that we can play around you know, with the capability. So I just want to highlight two use cases based on the information we share. So first thing first is SET has full control of our data. The airline partner has full control of the data. At any one point in time, the data can be cut off. So there's no access by the application to individual database. So assuming that we, we share, you know, data, um, put our, our, allow the access, full access. So first thing first, the load. So the first item, I think if you look at it, is load factor. So in this case, we share the load factor information, meaning we know how many customers, uh, you know, will be actually taking the next flight, that particular flight. And based on the demographic, we can actually optimize our inventory to be brought out to the plane, right? So if that particular flight has more um, family-centric travelers, we can fine-tune our, you know, our inventory to cater for more family purchase, right? So that's, that's the first thing. Of course, if, let's say, the flight is, uh, you know, it's not as full, it's only 50% capacity fill out, then we don't have to bring so many bottles of wine or, or Coca-Cola, which is quite heavy, onto the plane. So that's the first use case. The second use case is assuming that we have the passenger's knowledge. We have a pseudo uh, persona, you know, come that with the characteristic that in this knowledge space, and we can actually recommend, highlight to the, uh, the, the cabin crew to say that, okay, passengers at say nine, seats 19E is, uh, you know, is, is a past repeat customer and used to purchase this product, you know, in the past two flights. And the crowd, you know, the crew um, members can actively approach the customer and you know, to, to serve, provide a better experience because you know his preference or her preference. So I, I hope, you know, you get um, a high-level understanding of how, how, you know, how 
uh, technically how it works and also how powerful it is by having more data points. Right. The last one on, you know, on my presentation would be you know, the second problem statements where um, you know, we are able to actually use certain methodology to actually crawl the social media, um, to actually trying to detect the, the emerging trend of consumer preferences. So in this case, in the, in the studies, in the POC, we're particularly looking at the route between Singapore and Shenzhen. So we're just looking at a particular route and then look at the behavior of, you know, of the, the, the passengers. But more in particular is that you know, in that region, and in Shenzhen or in that part of the China, what is actually currently trending? You know, I mean, just, just interesting that during that time, you know, somehow Sprite, cucumber, you know, it, it, it's a word that actually come out from the, the research. But there's a lot more things to be done in terms of transcoping. It's really not easy. It's, it's, there's a lot of iteration, fine-tuning, understanding, validation of the trend. And what we are looking for is that hopefully we are able to actually create some unique, um, trendy product you know, for our airline partners and, and, you know, I mean, hopefully give them an edge for getting more customer flying with them. Yeah, so, well, I, I hope, you know, I mean, you benefit from these use cases and um, contact me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen. It was lovely having you. That was a very insightful presentation. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us here today. We definitely okay. hope to catch you in person again very soon. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. So next, we would like to move on to a poll question once again. So you will see a poll pop up on your screens. So do select the most appropriate option for you. So the question is, has your company participated in or accessed any of these STB initiatives? Is it a yes, no, not relevant, or you're not sure? Let's take a look at what most of you have been saying. So uh, a lot of you are keying in your options for the polls now. Um, happy to say that most of you said yes. Um, we've got some of you a little bit unsure. Uh, no worries about that. Let's uh, end the poll very quickly and let's take a look at the final results. So happy to report that most of you said yes. For those of you who said no or not sure, okay, do keep a look out for a lot of the amazing STB initiatives that will be coming your way. But for now, I would like to invite Mr. Taj Betty, Group Revenue Director of Park Hotel Group to share his presentation on enabling agile operations through data transformation. Park Hotel Group embarked on a data transformation journey along with STB last year. So, you know, if you want to ask him any question, you can head over to the Q&A function during his presentation. But for now, please join me to welcome Tachvir. This is, uh, this is the 2nd of March, and all of us are used to looking through our month end reports. But imagine uh, you're sitting in a meeting and you pull up a live dashboards, and everyone can see the live impact of their decisions. I'm Tejri Bedi, and I'm the Group Revenue Director of Park Hotel Group. I head Sales Revenue Management and Analytics. I'm here to talk about enabling agile operations through data transformation. Today, I'll talk about starting our data transformation journey, the process we followed, and the solution we adopted, along with our progress with a few use cases. We are Park Hotel Group. Uh, we are a leading uh, hospitality company. And we are currently based in 11 city and resort destinations. Uh, with, uh, along with Singapore Tourism Board, uh, in 2020, we worked on the data transformation project, which was rolled out to our two Singapore hotels with a plan to scale the project to all our hotels. So what does Agile mean? Agile means giving our teams the tools to successfully adapt to change and pivot rapidly to address, uh, address arising issues. Back in 2020, when the pandemic hit, most hotels were faced with not only lower demand, but uncertain demand patterns. Pre-pandemic, city hotels were geared to cater to corporate travel and had high demand Monday to Thursday. This changed. Taping demand, uh, we had taping demand on the weekends. Now we had to cater to the domestic market. This actually changed our demand patterns. So we started on our data transformation journey. And when we started, we were clear we wanted to make our operations more agile. The question remained, 
on how to implement that, who are the key stakeholders, and what data do we present to them to drive this impact. We did that in four stages, which I'll take you through in detail. The stages were discovery, design, develop, and deliver. So the problem statement here is enable agile operations, so, uh, operations management in this uncertain demand scenario. What do I mean by discovery? What was a key opportunity? Uh, what data could we use to drive this impact? Design, how can we link insight to relevant metrics? Develop, what is the tool we use or specify to specify the impact and aid decision making? And deliver, how do we deliver this process or solution to the right person at the right time? The solution was dashboards that connect our teams and enable them to collaborate. We identified the key stakeholders as the general managers or the operational heads of the hotel and the mode of delivery as dashboards that enable our teams to collaborate. The solution was enhanced visibility to key stakeholders. In order to drive maximum impact, we would develop dashboards with key metrics, delivering real-time data and metrics to operational heads and operational managers so they can plan and act fast in times of uncertain demand. Please mind, this was not only a visualization exercise. I needed to drive collaboration and process change. We developed a data transformation roadmap, and this roadmap lasts up to five years, with the aim uh, to discovering how to leverage data analytics to generate business insights, optimize op uh, operational efficiency, and workforce planning. As you can see here, this is a mock of uh, the dashboard we developed. We wanted to provide operational teams the same value our commercial team gets from data analytics and visibility to real-time data. By combining both operational and commercial metrics on a single dashboard, managers can enhance their meetings by looking at real-time metrics and impact to the final profitability of this hotel. This is the meeting I referenced uh, initially in my presentation. Let's start uh, with the use case of hotel operations. The most important mantra here is, what is measured can be improved. By providing visibility to real-time metrics on month-to-date and even forecast month-end basis, managers can optimize and plan in the middle of the month, and they don't really need to wait for month-end analysis. Let's uh, take the use case of mice. Operation managers can drill down into historical data on profit performance of similar size mice events and plan their staffing, inventory, and resource allocation for events. Forecast data can also be used to align monthly cost impact with revenue potential. What about bars and restaurants? Teams can now collaborate with restaurants and bars for cross-selling or bundling products. For example, packages that include meals can be planned for peak forecast dates. Uh, we, can include, uh, we can look at school holidays or peak dates or other holidays and make sure that operational managers are planning for higher resource allocation on peak dates with visibility to the final impact. A recap. A data transformation is a journey. And our journey, um, our plan for this journey is about five years. Not all data is created equal. The important thing to note is correlation is not causation. I'd like to take an example here. Imagine it's raining, and someone observes whenever it rains, my hotel occupancy is less than 50%. So it's a good observation. So imagine I take this data and use this hypothesis uh, and try to find if this hypothesis is correct, prove it wrong or right. Now this, in Singapore hotels, uh, when I say when it rains uh, and my occupancy is low, this is not the correct statement to make because the rain is not causing the occupancy to be lower. However, this very same statement for a resort uh, in a faraway location may be right because they may have a chartered flight and which was not able to take off because of rain. So not all data is really created equal. We must take care in choosing the relevant data for our objective. I'd like to recap our ongoing journey. Start with asking what are our key opportunities. Design the solution, link the solution to actionable insight, and deliver it to the right stakeholders. In this, in this case, um, we started with a problem. A problem was how do we enable 
agile operations for our team. How do our team, are we enable our team to react faster? Then we use the uh, structured and unstructured data sets to develop insights. After that, we used, uh, we did, decided that we will do a visual dashboards uh, and link those insight to metrics. And finally, we delivered those live dashboards to operational managers at the right time. Key takeaways for this initiative is, we have, this is an ongoing journey, and having access to real-time data and cross-referencing other metrics allows teams to collaborate and see the impact of their decisions together. The impact can be seen in resource allocation, energy consumption, inventory management, and other data. My final takeaway would be, our key learning was in promoting a data-driven culture and how our teams can collaborate better when everyone has visibility on how their decision impacts the hotel's performance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tachvia. It was a really lovely presentation. And uh, as usual, we are getting a lot of questions coming in for you as well. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the questions that we have uh, selected from our audience. Uh, how can we identify which is the correct data set to use and start our discovery process? What's your thoughts about it? So this is a great question. Uh, I would like to say, go back to my example that correlation is not equal to causation. So when you have an objective in mind, make sure that the data is not only correlated, but make also analyze whether a data set is actually causing an impact. I go back to my rain example. The rain is not actually causing the hotel to do bad or good in Singapore hotel scenario. But the same data is causal, is causing uh, the hotel to have a lower occupancy in a faraway island. So all data is not created equal. And when we have a set objective in mind, we must choose the correct data set. All data is not data equal. Yes. That's a great insight. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for sharing with us as well. Yeah. And we hope to see you again soon. Take care, Tachvia. Thank you. And next, I would like to invite Mr. Vima Gugadin, founder and CEO of GiveMe, to present data in the age of omnichannel events. Now, GiveMe participated in STB's data analytics shift program and has pivoted their business since COVID. So please join me to welcome Vima. Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Vimal and I'm from uh, GiveMe. For those of you who are not familiar, so GiveMe is a tech company. So we provide technology solutions for events uh, in all sorts of formats, uh, in-person, virtual, hybrid. And we work a lot with, within the mice industry, uh, with government, and also with uh, enterprises, with brands, and you can see some of the logos here. So just a, just a quick introduction on that. Uh, so I wanted to share with you a little bit of our, uh, of our data journey. Uh, so, and here I'm going to focus a little bit uh, on uh, the past two years, what we've been doing the past two years in terms of our own data journey, our own data transformation. So the first thing that we, that we put into place was uh, the team. It all starts with the team, but how do you build a capable team? Uh, and, and that's when we, we got introduced to the uh, STB's Dash program. And we went all in there. So we ensured that we had at least people from different uh, uh, departments uh, within the company, but at least people who will be able to come back and then drive changes. So that was important for us. Uh, so end of the day, I mean, uh, Dash program, there's lots of things that you learn out of it. Uh, but if you put aside all the academic uh, value of it, what uh, really helped uh, in, uh, in our case was really helped to drive a certain mindset change to uncover relevant and practical data applications, and then to bring about this change within, within our organization itself. And the next thing that we did was to ensure that there would be democratization of data. What do I mean by that? It's like making data available across different teams, sales, marketing, product, customer success, leadership, right? And we, when I say data, I'm just uh, using it in the loose sense of it, but it's really process data where you abstract all the difficult part of it and then make it available across departments. And what was also important for us was to make these data available across different tools. 
So like data shouldn't be the, the specific area of specific departments, like using BI tools, doing queries, complex queries and all that, even though we do that, but uh, putting, uh, making the data accessible in channels like email, through reports, dashboards, uh, or right within our CRM tools itself. So that was very key for us to ensure that transformation. And equally important was actually to really define, like we can just talk about data in the big sense of it, but to define really the different use cases. So we wanted to focus really on our own internal sales because we do enterprise sales. Like how could we leverage on, on uh, data to do uh, forecasting of meetings? How could we look at emails that uh, our salespeople were sending out to do sentiment analysis and to see where objections was happening and then uh, what were the objections. So rather than going through each and every email, like uh, this could be done uh, in mass. The next thing is, that, like I mentioned, we provide uh, virtual platforms, right? So we saw the opportunity to really, and, and for the past few years, as you know, that really boomed, right? Uh, how could we uh, analyze the data and then come up with certain industry benchmarks. And then the next thing is how could we use our own set of data uh, as a market sensing lens to derive what are future trends that are up and coming. So today uh, I'd like to take these two uh, areas uh, and then to share a bit more uh, with you about it. So the first thing is virtual industry benchmarks. Uh, I'm going to share a bit of some of the benchmarks that we have done. And this whole journey started from an exercise, actually. And an exercise that we learned uh, out, of, uh, out of Dash, uh, a question storm. So where you basically start asking all sorts of questions that you think might be relevant. And then you start classifying it, whether it's relevant, whether you have the data to be able to generate this and all that. So we did that exercise, uh, filtered that, and then came up with some, uh, uh, some benchmarks that we thought would be useful for the industry. So today I'm just going to share with you uh, a sample of that. So the first thing was, if let's say you're running a virtual event, and by the way, this would apply also for a hybrid event. If you're doing online registration for people to attend, be it free or paid, when should you actually close uh, the registration? Now this is very typical. As an industry, the mice industry is used to that. It's like close registration uh, right before the event starts, or, or even in some cases a few days before the event starts. Now, what happens uh, if you do that? If you would have left your registration, for example, open during the event and after the event, this is what we see as today being the industry standard. If you leave it open during the event, during the day or days of your event, you can expect an additional bump of 18% of additional people registering, especially if your content is good the numbers will go even higher because uh, people do sharing right within the event and then getting their colleagues to join in, right? If you leave it open after the event, you can get a bump of an additional 10% registration. So again, depending on the nature of your event, whether it's free, whether it's for branding purposes, whether it's for lead generation purposes, I thought these will be very uh, key metrics for, uh, for us all to see and understand as an industry. The next thing is virtual events. What's the average attendance rate, right? So here what we saw was uh, it's 55%, right? Uh, quite low uh, compared to physical events, but if you're doing more than that, then uh, you know you're above industry average. And then the thing is, uh, after an event is over, how many people come back uh, to view the content of the event if you make it available? If you make it available, it's actually quite a big proportion, more than half, 56% will come back and view that. And the next thing is how many people come to the event, not during the event days or day, uh, but after the event for the first time. It's actually 15% who would uh, be coming in. These are obviously new people who are registering, and also people who didn't uh, manage to catch it and then coming back. So, so, so that showed us, like for example, uh, well, events content has a shelf life, what we define as a shelf life. Uh, this chart, what it's showing you here, is the days after an event. How many people are coming back to the platform, whatever that is, uh, to access the content? So this is obviously based on, uh, on our own platform, uh, amalgamated, right? Uh, but you, you can see that uh, the, the traffic decays over time. But what we've been able to find out here is that there is indeed a shelf life for digital content. And today the benchmark is that is 46 days. So when you create great content out of your event, in fact, for the next 46 days, without doing much of activities, you will probably get people coming back 
to the to the platform to the content to consume that because that's still fresh right so lots of opportunity there so the next thing that we looked at is in the case of uh, <clears throat> live events if there is a live stream how many people will actually end up watching the full live stream what we found out was it's actually 45%. So people will watch only 45% of a live stream. The next thing is video on demand. You make videos available. So some events make the full event as, a, as an eight-hour video, as a two-hour video, as a one-hour video. Uh, but how much of it uh, uh, people actually watch? And in this case here, what we found that it's not about the percentage, but it's act the actual value, which is true regardless of the length of the event. And that magic number is actually 19 minutes. So people would spend, on average, uh, 19 minutes to watch on-demand uh, content. So if you're creating videos that are much more than that, then you're going to be aware of this. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to share also is some of the trends and insights that we've been, uh, that we've been seeing. And I wanted to start like with, uh, like here, there's Gina, who is a CMO uh, from a... Uh, uh, from Charles River Laboratories, she has got the typical profile of what we would call an exhibitor, so selling B2B to a B2B uh, audience. And what CMOs today, what she is saying today is that she's already seeing value of virtual platforms, but at the same time, she's looking at ways of optimizing live engagement, meaning in person, right? So, 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 so that's her opinion. But there's another study which I wanted to, to probably bring here, is, uh, and this is a very recent survey uh, from, uh, from McKinsey. And it, here it talks about B2B buyers. So think of B2B buyers as your attendees for your events, right? For your trade shows, for your conferences. So today, uh, two thirds of B2B buyers actually prefer digital channel as opposed to uh, in person. In fact, for the first time, B2B e-commerce doing transaction online has actually surpassed, if you see that, uh, in person uh, in terms of uh, engagement channels. And, and B2B buyers today are actually using more channels. Back in 2016, it used to be, it used to be uh, five channels. What we are seeing today is uh, B2B buyers will go through up to 10 channels on average. Uh, interacting with suppliers through emails, attending shows uh, through phone, in person as well is is one of the uh, important channels here, right? Uh, when we look at it from the other side, like uh, in terms of uh, in terms of exhibitors now, so back to Gina, like what are they planning to do? So B two B suppliers who are typically the the, the uh, exhibitors at events are looking at events a little bit differently. Because it's no more just about the event itself, but it's like, for example, yes, participating at a trade show, but what is it that you're going to do pre-event as your own marketing activities during event and post-event? Like, for example, here, as you can see, uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, exhibitors plan to spend 60% of, uh, of, their, of, their, of their time on pre-event content on social media uh, communities, right? So on LinkedIn and stuff during event as well, and then post event as well. So 60% say they will uh, spend uh, time on these engagement channels. And in fact, the list goes on because there are now much more engagement channels that exhibitors are going after in the context of an event. Like for example, they will do Facebook live streaming for consumer shows, uh, live streaming, online lessons, uh, doing even their own events, educational uh, events right during the show. So there's a whole bunch of uh, there's a whole bunch of activities that now sponsors want to organize themselves uh, during uh, before, during, and after a show, uh, or, or, or or get help on. That was probably uh, a little bit confusing, but what does that mean, right, uh, for events? What we think that means for events is that the future of events is omnichannel. What do I mean by that? It used to be the day where like shows, uh, events was, was pretty much physical. And then we've seen that for the past two years, virtual. And then now there's the talk that uh, it's hybrid, where it's really a you know, combination of the physical uh, and virtual. But what's really happening as a trend today is omnichannel, where the customer is put right at the center 
And then there's a whole bunch of, uh, and there's a whole bunch of engagement channels, uh, both in person and digital that happens. So for everybody who is saying like, for example, hey, nothing beats face to face, face to face is not gonna get, uh, go away, that's true. Because one third of B2B buyers out there will always uh, be doing uh, in-person engagement. But the rest, two thirds, is today digital. All right, so just some quick tips here. Uh, like what are some of the strategies that organizers can use? And we see that as some of the strategies to use for an omni-channel context is the possibility to use micro events, micro content, and micro transaction. So what do I mean by that? Like for example, now it's no more about just running one event and then engaging uh, customers uh, just uh, during the timing itself. But it's about doing a whole year-long engagement. And that's what micro events can help to do. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you don't do like a big show anymore. Micro events could actually help to boost attendance and fidelity and loyalty for your main events. This chart that you're seeing here is what we're seeing as an average of, uh, of uh, forward-looking organizers who've been adopting this strategy. And one of which is actually Web in Travel with, like last year, they, they, they run six roadshows. They choose to call that roadshows. And that took the form of, of virtual events, but not just virtual events. Some of them were in-person, uh, hybrid, but small scale. And this whole thing actually led to the main event itself, which was an MBS, obviously in-person. But then guess what? With the digital component as well in there. So hybrid event, right? The next thing is around micro-content. So back to the same uh, example of, uh, of wit here. So today, what they have is a, a, is a, is a uh, 365 content library where you can go in there to, to watch all the bite-sized content that they've been creating. But then it's not just promoting it on your own channels, but promoting it on different channels through email, through blog posts. And that's what uh, events uh, create. And then using this micro-content strategy, you're able to reach out to your customers, engage your customers even more. And lastly, microtransaction. Uh, monetization has been a big thing within the mice industry. How do we monetize in this new world? What I have for you here is just uh, an example of what's being tried today. And I thought that's pretty cool. FinTech Festival is an event that happened right during the event. Uh, on top of watching uh, the whole show and all that, what you could do was, you know what, pay an additional amount of money to be able to get a certificate. And today the event is over, but you can still go register and then pay $25 to watch all the content and then to, you know what, go through the certification process and get that. And I think that's what probably we need, really lots of experimentation with regards to microtransaction itself. And with that, I want to thank you all. Thank you so much, Mima. It was very nice to see you and also to hear from your insightful presentation. And we hope to catch you again in person very soon. Thank you. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, we have yet another quick and easy poll for you. I promise this is the last one already. So let's bring it up onto the screen so that everybody can take a look at what it is. So poll number four says, overall, I am satisfied with Tourism Data Leadership Conference 2022. Do you strongly agree? Do you agree? Neither agree nor disagree. Disagree. And I hope that you do not strongly disagree. So please key in your uh, answers for us so that we can keep track of how you feel about today's conference. So I'm giving you some time to, giving everybody some time to uh, key that in. And also in the meantime, do know that the chat box is still opened. Uh, feel free to have a chat with the rest of the attendees as we are coming close to the end of today's conference. All right, so let's end the poll. Let's take a look. Um, most of you agree. Uh, also, a bunch of you said that you strongly agree as well. Thank you so much for participating in the polls. We're glad that most of you are satisfied with today's conference. We have summarized five of STB's data initiatives and resources on this slide for your easy reference. You may wish to join T-Cube Connect, our tourism data community, or number two, Join Data Analytics Shift 2.0 program to work on enterprise-level problem statements with the help of mentors. Number three, join Data Transformation Program 2.0 for cross-industry collaborations. Number four, 
used Singapore Tourism Analytics Network to view visualizations and perform an analysis on tourism-related data. And number five, access STB Data College to learn from case studies and leverage data analytics resources. We will be sending this slide to you, or you can also take a screenshot of it. And finally, let us know what you think about today's conference. Please scan this QR code on the screen or access the survey link in the chat with your email address to gain full access to the event recording and conference materials in about a week's time. So with that, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you for your attention. And I definitely hope to see all of you again next year. Take care and goodbye.